A butterfly is the symbol for the 140,000 people who passed through a little-known concentration camp in Czechoslovakia during World War II. The camp was called Terrorism, and Jewish men, women, and children stayed there briefly on their way to the furnaces at Auschwitz. What made Terrorism particularly important and shocking was that Hitler declared it an official Jewish state. There, the Jews were to find rest, recreation, food, and comfort, and indoctrination into the German way of life. Why a Jewish state? News had begun to leak out in 1943 that Nazi concentration camps were actually extermination camps. So Hitler fabricated a model camp, terrorism, for all the world to see. He even invited the Red Cross to visit to see for themselves the good the Nazis were doing. Little distinguished terrorism from other camps, but on the day of the Red Cross visit, it was virtually turned into a Hollywood movie set. So-called inmates played soccer, went to work, attended lectures, read books. The soccer players were really German soldiers. The work activities were faked, as were the lectures, and the books had blank pages. The Nazis made a propaganda film of the activities in this Jewish state, which we'll show you soon. But the real reason for showing you this captured film is the recent publishing of a book called The Last Butterfly by Michael Jacko. The Last Butterfly is the partly fictional story of Antonin Karash, a clown forced to entertain children at terrorism who were on their way to the gas chambers. The Nazis wanted him to perform during the Red Cross visit. He wouldn't. The butterfly, as we said earlier, is the symbol for many of the people at Terrazin. But why the butterfly and why the last one? Mr. Jacko will answer that, but before he does, let me read you a poem written by one of the 15,000 children at Terrazin, and it's called The Butterfly. The last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sting against a white stone, such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto, but I have found my people here. The dandelions call to me, the white chestnut candles in the court, only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. The, the butterfly is a free animal, which is, symbolizes beauty and freedom and, uh, and everything which is lovely in the world. And this was the last one. Uh, every, uh, with every soul that went from Terezin to Auschwitz. It's the last grasp at hope, I suppose. Uh, at hope, uh, also uh, for humanity, too, in a, in a larger sense. Before you tell me something of the specifics of uh, the camp itself, Michael, can you tell me of your experiences in uh, discovering yet in the first place and what it was, because it's largely, I think, unknown to most people. They've heard of, the, of the, the adult death camps themselves, but never of this particular one. I discovered it had been made in the war into a Jewish state by Hitler, specifically for the Jews, uh, supposedly run by the Jews with their own money, their own uh, bread, their own facilities for everything. But in actual fact, it had been a concentration camp which had been covered up uh, because it, news was beginning to leak out about things that were happening in other concentration camps. Uh, a concentration camp which was um, there as a, as a point from which they would send them to Auschwitz and various other places, mainly to Auschwitz. So it's a very sad thing because on the, on the surface, and I have some film which I think we're going to see and you'll mm -hmm. see it, on the surface of it all, it looked as though Hitler was giving a big gift to the Jews. Here is a place for 150,000 of you. It's only designed for 6,000, but never mind. Here's your Jewish state, but stay within there. You discovered it this way then, and uh, what did you do? Investigate if, if there were any survivors, find out about uh, uh, what life was like there. Why did you pursue it? Most people from the war, my experience has been, is that they try to forget and uh, not talk at all about these things. Well, I've you... been through the war in Burma, and um, I don't know. When I got inside Terezin, I cannot really describe what happened to me. It's an almost a mystical experience. 
because the walls themselves, the grey, drab, wet walls, and the, the tracks where the railway engines used to come in with the trains to take them to Auschwitz, they're all there, the same. And they haven't been fancied up for tourists or anything like that. Uh, the place seemed to engulf me. And, I, and I, I remember going back in the car to Prague, which is 60 kilometers, and I could hardly speak at all, not from emotion. It just sort of uh, had come like a big damp cloud over me. And the thing gradually began to build up, and I went out again. And this sounds corny, but I couldn't help it. I lay on the bunks. I put my hands along the rough wood where the feet marks had been made going up and to get into bed. I put my hands on the edge of the firing range where the bullet holes were. Um, I walked around where all the Nazi guards had been and everything like that, and I became even more involved in it. It's one thing to be there, it's another to see it, but uh, hard not to, to ask you now to, to let us see some film, and I think the film is in two, two sorts of uh, parts. Can you tell us uh, what they are? Yes, the first part, Paul, is as it actually happened when people came to the camp. This footage, I don't know where it was taken. I don't know how it was taken. It was probably some strange German quirk that they should take film of people arriving at the camp for some record purposes. Anyway, this first part is all actually as they, the, the people were arriving at the camp in reality. And the second film is a propaganda film made by the Germans specifically for the Red Cross who were coming to visit the place uh, to show the world what a joyous, happy life these people had in Terezin. And I'd like you to see the first uh, bit, first of all. This is the main entrance to the camp and uh, the courtyard where I would think probably here there are about eight to nine hundred people arriving. They're calling out the names. And you'll notice that people come up and they're given numbers, and they, all the possessions are being taken away. When you look into these faces, you have to remember the small boy there, too, that um, they no longer exist, not more than 1,500 of them, anyway, of the 150,000 that went through. Could you tell me approximately what year this would have been occurring? This, the, the big push into Terezin was from 43 on. That late? That late, but they had opened a camp up in 41. Now at this point, do you think these people know where they are and why they're here? I don't think they know uh, why they're there. They know the, the, where they are, yes, definitely. Terezin was known. Uh, but it was thought that they were sent to labor camps or something afterwards. These are protectorate policemen, Czechs, who are working for the uh, Germans. I think um, they assumed that they went on from there to various other parts of Europe to help in the German war effort to make railway lines and things like that. Which was why when they went in, they didn't struggle as in a, in a, in a deathly way. Later on they did, when they realized what was going to happen to them. After all, people were moved about all over Europe for various labor reasons during the war. These um, were for carrying babies and they were then taken away. And this is their belongings all being boarded up. And that is actuality film, very telling in the... You know, in a, in a strange way, there's a, a very great art and craft in the shooting of that film. It's an extraordinarily skilled filming, don't you think? I think it's very well done. It, is it, it, chilling, in a this way. This is the peculiar thing about that, the wartime German mentality, that they had this idea that they would make great art out of it all. They were perfectly right in, in, in showing these people whom they knew were going to their deaths. And they even used them as actors. And in the bit of film you're going to see next, you'll see the, uh, all sorts of things happening. But they were all rehearsed. They had two days rehearsal. And they forced people. And they thought it was perfectly natural. The Red Cross were coming to visit. So they cleared a certain part of the camp. 
and they put a great big green wall up, a high green wall, over which nobody could come and over which they would not take anybody. Although, but no, although funnily enough, nobody was asked to be taken, which is a weird thing when you come to think of it. And they, then they made, on the, on the other side of the camp, they made what you will see in the film, which is a film set. Mm. Oh, yes, right now, this first part of it uh, is showing the, the German commentary says the happy inmates of Terezin uh, are at work um, making themselves useful and uh, applying themselves to the uh, skills and arts that are inherent within them. In actual fact, uh, no work was allowed and uh, the making of art or drawings was uh, punishable by death. And yet the inmates, uh, I don't want to use the word cooperated, but at least they, they had to go along with, with being uh, in this film. Yeah, they had to because every other one of them approximately, according to the people who I've spoken to who survived, um, were German soldiers. They were all around all the time. And um, these, these barracks uh, are not in the camp at all. They're in Prague. Um, these people must have been... There was a pre terrorism concentration camp point in Prague where they uh, all went. Now, Terrazin itself has no wooden buildings, never had, so um, these are obviously wooden army huts, and, uh, and uh, I found out that they were, it was taken in Prague. Um, the German commentary to this was that um, here were these Jews who voluntarily made boots for Hitler's army. Hmm. Now, they all stood up suddenly, rather, there. You can see that the director went a little bit too far. Well, this is supposed well, to be the end of the, the working day? Yes, this is the end of the working day, but they, um, on, a, on an order, they obviously stood up. And here they are, crossing the uh, camp to spend a free evening, as it says in the commentary, to do what they wish. Once again, if you think of every other or every third person here, anyway, as being no longer here. It's quite terrifying. Now, this is in Terrazin. This is near the first part of where they shot the first part of the film. In a minute, through this archway, mm. you will see there, as they're coming through that archway, they're coming into the square. This is the same square, and they set up for the Red Cross a soccer match between the, the German soldiers, the SS, and uh, the inmates. And um, these people were all Behind these rows of people, apparently, were men with machine guns. And the people on the ground floor were mostly Nazis. Um, some of the children were from the camp. Uh, it's very strange to see, when we get to some of the close-ups, that uh, the children seem to be quite enjoying the game despite everything. And uh, it is indicative of what I do believe, that. Uh, under the most terrible suffering conditions, life still could, still goes on. People it's can't the most extraordinary-looking soccer court, you know, that it just seems so small and in quite the wrong place. It does not it's, look well, like... It isn't the real one. It's, it's inside yeah. that courtyard, courtyard where we saw yes. them taking away the, uh, their belongings. Having enjoyed the soccer, they now were mar go through the streets here, the central, to the war, the central town. Here are the showers. There were no showers except uh, ones that were building for other purposes in Terrazin. But this was to show them after the soccer match, I guess. But you'll notice some of them, some of them are different people. They're old men coming out of the showers. Mm. Now, this was a happy life on, the, on the, the main street. Here we have some shots of them, uh, the library that they are supposed to have had, which was actually the... Um, the German officer's library. It is in Terezin. Um, and here is a, a lecture given by a German to the elders of the camp. Um, this was supposed to indicate that they were happily becoming German, Germanized, if that's the word. 
Because I noticed all the signs were in German rather yes. than, oh, yes. this place is in Czechoslovakia. No, yeah, nobody was allowed to speak Czech or write Czech. And they, of course, they're all wearing normal clothes and everything. Look at the flowers on the table. This is the beginning of a concert. It's perhaps the saddest scene of all to me because that's my friend Carol Anchel, who was uh, the conductor of the Toronto Symphony, yes. who just died. And he was forced uh, to go and do this. And he had no shoes. So they put flowers in front of the stage to cover his... his uh, he had a wooden platform to stand on with his more or less bare feet, bare feet. This is where the German officers had a garden and um, it was around the corner at the back there was the f place where the firing squad shot in between these two large walls. You could see the thickness of them. That's where they went they shot people. But this, around this side of it is a garden owned by the German officers. And this was supposed to be, well, it was an acted out scene of people working in their own garden allotments, as it were. Mm. Where, of course, all they had for food was a little bit of hard bread and some potato soup every day. As we're watching it, you know, I'm wondering at the time it was made, purpose for which it was made, if it got circulated out, and what people thought of it, did they believe it? I can tell you after, <coughs> Paul, uh, the, the, some, of, some of the people did believe it, yes, I'm afraid. These are here they are, resting in the evening, sunbathing, reading books, which were, of course, was utterly forbidden. Um, the terrace in the barracks were divided, so there were only women in one barrack, children in another, and men in another, and the men were allowed to visit with their wives once a week, but they were not allowed to have children. And here you see them all together in one barracks. They were under the walls, a lot of these, in the, under those thick walls. A nurse sitting in, which is incredible because there weren't any nurses. And here they're making something. Uh... These were the actual bunks. But uh, they, the children would not be, have been playing with dolls, of course. It all looks very temporary, you know. Well, I think it's obviously a, it is obviously a fake. Um, and we know it was, because it was rehearsed. But um, these were probably some of the people who had just come into the camp, because they don't look like the people who left for Auschwitz. There's a Catholic priest playing cards with them, some of his parishioners, supposedly. And here's a mirror and makeup. Any possessions were immediately confiscated, as we saw at the beginning of the, uh, the real film. And here is a family at dinner, which I think is the most horrifying sight of all because it's the big lie there then is film of what we were told we should believe or what uh, was the propaganda can you give me an idea then Michael of what really happened day to day they were all woken up by um, loudspeakers which were attached to the corner of every building about five in the morning and they were pleased to be woken up, and they were ready to go, dressed, because uh, the cooks had prepared this sort of potato broth, which was in oil barrels, and, uh, and they were giving out bread. And the big thing, apparently, was, would you eat all the bread now, or would you save it for little bits during the day, for when you got hungry? And I asked one of these people at the Jewish Museum in Prague, and she said she always ate her straight away. And I said, why? She said, well, because I don't know whether I'm going to be here at the end of the day, and somebody might steal it from me during the day, so it might as well be in my stomach straight away now, when I know I've eaten it. Um, and this was all they got to eat. Then they went to various work parties within the camp. This was uh, 
helping in the uh, officers' mess and the, the tr to look after the troops and so on, um, helping in the crematorium. Um, the men went out and uh, dug ditches uh, to, for to keep the place fortified and so on. Um, the children were taken to various rooms, uh, mostly up in the roof, what would have been the attics of the old houses, and split up, and they were taught German. Now, in actual fact, uh, they were taught Czech secretly, and the poems and the, uh, in Czech and uh, the uh, drawings that they made under those conditions, they had a secret tapping noise that was made by one of them downstairs if anybody was coming, were hidden, buried in the camp, and they are now published in a book um, which has been, become quite famous in the United States. One of the poems was The Last Butterfly. Mm -hmm. So th th this, th it's a work day uh, for all the people, and then... Then, then nothing, and they went back to their, to their billets, and uh, they had, uh, sometimes they had to, uh, they would get, uh, somebody would die, and they would take the clothes off the person who had died to make other things, like sheets and so on. And occasionally the children would tr try and put on, quietly, little plays up in these attics, and they would use little bits of stolen material and stolen props to, uh, to, to act with. But apart from that, there wasn't any activity. They did have some soccer teams there themselves, but they were not allowed to actually play soccer. They were allowed to play in the courtyard, not as, not a form, as formally as we saw, but they were allowed to play kicking a ball around. And how long would people stay or live or be made to stay at this camp before moving on, if they did? It would depend, Paul. The, they got rid of the troublesome ones as fast as they could, anyone who offered resistance. And there was, contrary to uh, what we've heard, there was quite a bit of resistance after they knew where they were uh, and what was happening. Uh, they would stay maybe a year, the others. Some of the older ones they would get rid of because they would become a nuisance. Uh, they would get sick and they wouldn't know where to put them or what to do with them. Uh, they would be sent on trains. And then occasionally, just before the Red Cross visit, they got rid of um, something like 20,000 people. And among them were the children that I've written about here. Um, the children were always very difficult because they, in some peculiar reverted conscience that the Nazis had, they became troubled by the children knowing that they were going to their deaths. And uh, this is why they, in they invited, um, or kept on rather, after the Red Cross visit, the, the comedian that I write about in the book. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, disposition of this place now? Is it a tourist uh, spot with monuments and whatever and abandoned, or what, what is being used? Is it being used for today, Terrazin? Terrazin uh, is uh, a little country town today. Uh, strangely enough, and this is what fascinated me too, the, some of the inhabitants, the original inhabitants, have moved back in. Some more from the surrounding countryside have come in, and they've set up bakeries, and uh, they've got an inn, and the church is open, and uh, the whole place is run, just as if it were a little town, except when you go in, you have to go through that narrow gate, and uh, you have these high walls around you, and it's a terribly depressing place, uh, without the memories. But with the memories, too, it must be almost, I don't know how they do it, but the people have always lived in that area, and I suppose they're, they're used to it. They have kept one corner of it as it was during the Nazi regime. Does it strike you a little strange, more than you've said, that instead of leaving it be because of what was there, that people should be occupying? I mean, how, how can you account for people actually being able to move around and lead a life there? I don't know. I, I can't account for it except that I think it was very wise of the Czech government not to make it a uh, super-duper tourist attraction. Why? Because I think that cheapens the whole thing and makes it um, become an extravaganza um, and also plasters the guilt about the place. Uh, after all, it's not the guilt we want to get at. What we want to get at is that keep repeating that this has happened. This is happening today various parts of the world. And it will continue to happen until we're more aware 
of ourselves and more open to each other. Uh, they have left this small corner, as it is, with the graveyards and so on of those who were shot there or hanged. And um, apart from that, in actual fact, the, the, you wouldn't know the inside uh, had been a concentration camp uh, from any other ch little Czech town, except that it is even more depressing as a town. I think it's a, I think in the long run, it's a good thing they let people back, but why they're living there, God only knows. Antonin turned the bucket upside down and stood on it. Before him suddenly was his audience. He could see them all, rows and rows of children. They were already laughing, for the dancers had been on before him. The audience seemed to go into the distance, fading into a mist, but up front were so many faces that would never leave him.